Welcome everyone to another episode of Modern Dentist, the podcast where we talk about the things that we think every modern dentist should know from health to tech um, to dentistry itself. And we try and bring you the most fascinating guests uh, to do that. So today we have got Raj Ratan with us, who is going to be talking about positivity in dentistry, something that we all need. So my first question to Raj is going to be, who is Raj? Well, firstly, Sonia, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here um, and I'm very pleased to take part. Um, who's Raj? Uh, well, it's a good, good question. Um, uh, I, uh, I came to this country with my parents and my brother uh, aged about six or seven years of age. So most of my schooling was was done here um, and decided at a relatively young age, probably the age of about 15 or 16, that I wanted to do dentistry. I was influenced by uh, my aunt, actually, who was a medic at the time. She's now retired. Um, she was studying for her examinations to go and work in the USA. And I remember speaking to her about a healthcare, um, a, a career in healthcare. And she said that she felt that dentistry would be well suited to me. She felt that I probably couldn't cope with the the, the 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 trauma and the tragedy that you see in medicine and i think she was right i think she she had a good understanding of my personality a very very good friend of mine who later became my business partner somebody i've known since age uh, eight or nine he is a couple of years older than me he'd gone into dentistry himself so that was an added impetus and uh, so i studied at university college hospital in london um, in those days it was a four and a half year course uh, qualified, worked in South London at a delightful practice with some delightful people. Worked for about um, two years as an associate. And then got a call one evening from my long-standing friend who I've mentioned. And he said to me, he said, oh, there's a practice available for sale in Oxford. Let me tell you a little bit about it. Uh, might you be interested in um, joining me and we'll go into partnership? And I said, well, let me speak to my parents. I spoke to my parents and they said, well, uh, we, we, we know Robin, my friend's name. Uh, we know Robin, we've known him for many years and we trust him. So if you want to go into partnership with him, that's absolutely fine. So I committed to my first practice without even seeing it. Um, and that was in Oxford. Worked there for a few years, then started a um, second practice, which was uh, in, in, in London, in, in, in Bromley, in, um, in, in the London, on, on the London Kent border. And then uh, basically stayed there until the time the practice was sold. In between, I've done other things. I was always interested in dentistry from a lot of different angles. So I was very fortunate. I got involved with foundation training um, at an you know, age, I think I was at the time, I was about 29 years old, I think. And um, then stayed working in foundation training for about 17 years. Um and I was the strategic associate dean in, in, in London. I did some consultancy work for various corporate bodies. I did some work with Denplan. I joined Dental Protection in 1992 as a one-day-a-week part-time dental legal advisor. And then in 2016, um, took on the role of dental director there. So in a nutshell, that's been my potted history over some 30 years, yeah. I love that. Yeah. The reason I said um, who is Raj is because as clinicians, your profession is so intertwined with your yes. identity. Yes. And it's very common that you'll ask someone who they are and they'll say, I'm a dentist first Indeed. and foremost. Indeed. Above and beyond anything else. What do you think about that? Is that right? Well, uh, <laughs> I'm smiling here, Sonia, because the reason I'm smiling is because I can remember being uh, qualified about a year and we were invited to a, um, a small gathering at our neighbor's house. I lived at home in Northwest London at the time. And our neighbors were having a small gathering and uh, we got invited to that. And I was introduced by our neighbor's wife to some of her friends uh, as, as follows. Oh, this is Raj. He lives next door. He's a, he's a dentist. And I remember at the time thinking to myself, oh, my goodness gracious me, is that it? <laughs> is, that the, is that the sum total of my existence? And it really made me think long and hard about um, what you call this notion of identity. 
And for me, the key to it was that my professional persona was very similar to my personal persona. So, you know, I would always say, I always thought of myself, thought of myself as somebody who was the same at work as they were at home. I'm not sure my wife and children would agree with that, but um, but but it, but it, but in a sense that that to me was very very important because I felt that it meant that you were an authentic person, and that's always been a big um, big influence on me that 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 notion of authenticity. Um, in terms of as a person, um, I think I've always been very interested in helping others, and that's an important part of my career, obviously but also in my personal life. And as I look forward, you know, I want to do more in that sphere, perhaps outside dentistry as well. Um, I spent a long time in education, and, and again, that's about helping people. I worked at dental protection a long time. Again, that's about helping people. So I think um, for me, it's about uh, working with people. I enjoy the company of people. And as I grow older, I have a slightly more philosophical view on life, I think, as most people do. Um, so I think that, that that's probably the, the, the Raj, the person. Yeah. So when you think about um, what people ex- – you talked about a young Raj going and yes. starting a career in dentistry with yes. expectations of what it might be like. Indeed. What do you think – is there a gap between what people expect when they leave dental school or perhaps even when they apply – and the reality of work today, and what impact do you think that's having on dentists? Uh, my my view on that, uh, which I base on my extensive experience of working with recent graduates, you know, even though now I'm not involved with foundation training, each year I do uh, presentations to a number of new graduates, and I think there is a mismatch in expectations. Um, and what is actually what the profession is actually delivering, I think it's not just a mismatch. I think the other challenge also now is the the time frame. So I think if you enter the profession, you can have very realistic expectations, but you have to sometimes be prepared to wait for those expectations to be realised. I think what's happening nowadays is that there's a tendency to want all expectations to be met in the first two or three years, and life's not like that. Yeah, life's not like that. As a young dentist, um, I know I'll share this story with you because it, for me it was very powerful. Um, myself and a couple of my friends, we would go back to the school that we went to uh, once a month. And the reason that we would go back is that there was a teacher at the school who used to do um, lessons in chess. And then we, we were at the time, we were keen chess players. So occasionally we'd, we'd wander back into the school and have a lesson or two. And there was one day when I was there with a friend of mine who was also a dentist. We'd been qualified about a year, 18 months. And we were chatting to each other and very disillusioned with the profession at the time. And I felt, you know, maybe I made a mistake in choosing dentistry because to me it was very repetitive. Um, and I thought, goodness gracious, you know, is this what it's going to be like for the next X years. Unknown to us at the time, our teacher, our tutor in the background could hear all this. And um, he he said to us just before we left, he said, he said, gentlemen, he said, I hear your discussions and I'm disappointed that you feel the way that you do about your profession. He said, but let me let me try and reassure you. And he said, I've always said to you that your life and your um, profession, you know, it's like a game of chess. And like a game of chess, he said, always remember that sometimes you move forwards, sometimes you have to move sideways, and sometimes you have to move backwards. So long as you are in the game, there is no shame in moving backwards. And I thought to myself, that's a very powerful. And what he was basically saying was, you know, don't be overambitious, be realistic. And there will be pauses in your career. And there may be times where you look at your life professionally and think to yourself, actually, last two or three years, I've not really gone anywhere. But that's okay. That's okay. Because that's the pause. Uh, And, you know, your your pause can be a stepping stone towards 
um, moving forward at a future date. So I think that's what I would say to people today. I would say, you know, get the timeline realistic with expectations and actually don't worry if you move backwards um, so long as you're still in the game. That's such a powerful sentiment. And I think you're tapping into something there around, in, you know, in a modern world, how instantly people expect to be gratified. Absolutely. yes. And the fact that this is a uh, career that requires years of skill and discipline to master and that, of course, it's not going to happen overnight. Yes. So, so I think that's something that probably a lot of people need to hear. Actually, this podcast is, is, is a lot more about the positive side, but I think yes. in order to frame how we think about positivity, maybe helpful to, to explain where you think the areas are that are stresses in, in dentistry at the moment that people, people can probably relate to. Okay. Um, well, firstly, I think, I think there's a couple of things. I think broadly speaking, if you look at stress in dentistry, it's, it's pretty much, you can classify it into two areas. You know, and we can call that quantitative overload and um, qualitative overload. So quantitative overload, too much to do in too little time. Um, and qualitative overload, the pressures to deliver to the highest possible standards and standards that are rising all the time. So I think generically, those two areas are the main areas of stress. And you know, the, 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 when it comes to time pressure, this has been a feature of dental practice you know, since I qualified. You know, I can remember reading a paper written by um, Professor Cary Cooper, who was a professor of organizational psychology, I think in Manchester, I might be wrong about where he was based, but he did some of the early work on stress in dentistry. And, you know, this idea of um, time pressure was, was, was well known back then. So I don't think it's a new phenomenon at all. I think we are seeing it in a different context, but I think it's, it's still very much um, that one of the driving forces of stress in dentistry. I think the other thing also is that um, expectations are high. Um, I think that, that contributes to it. But the area that's perhaps most troublesome right now is the new graduates' fear of litigation. And we've done studies at Dental Protection, and, and I know the BDA have done studies as well, which kind of confirm that, you know, that the fear of litigation is something that's a, of great concern to recently qualified dentists. And I think that's the first thing that we should we should address. I couldn't agree more. Yes. I mean, you know, we obviously first met in the context of trying in, in a mutual, um, sorry, with a mutual goal to help reduce dentists' risk. Yes. Um, us at 32 Co by giving more support mentorship and, and partnering with Dental Protection because of that. But that's not just a... That's not a financial yeah. uh, point. That that's to do with the well-being of the clinician Absolutely. and the confidence that they have to come into work every day. Yes. So, the fact that you're seeing that in the studies, and particularly for young dentists, yes. I think is is very relevant, and it needs to be talked about. So, what are the misconceptions about about you know litigation and and risk? Well, firstly, I think it's important to understand that the threat of litigation actually is is nowhere near what people perceive it to be. And and I really want to emphasize that. You know, from our studies and our data um, at Dental Protection, you know, that suggests to us that the average dentist may be sued, uh, you know, two times, three times over a practicing career. And when you look at the numbers of and the number of clinical interactions there are over a career, that's actually a very small percentage, and certainly not a percentage that should that anybody should lose sleep over. So what we have here is what is often described as the risk perception gap, um, and it's it's very significant because if we overestimate the risks then it's going to affect the way that we work. And there's some very interesting work being done on, you know, why people have this risk perception gap. And, you know, and we can chat about that as well today. But I think, um, you know, I just want to reassure those people that are watching this and listening to this, that actually if you look at the data and the statistics, um, things are nowhere near as um, troublesome as the data, as, this, as the perception. 
I think that's really important. I yes. think the fear of this looming shadow over your daily work. Um, I mean, I don't think what you're saying is uh, be gung ho about your work yes, and yes, be flippant. No, no, I think standards all, obviously need to need to remain, but yeah. it shouldn't be necessarily overshadowed by a constant fear. Yes. If you're doing good dentistry, good exactly. quality dentistry, yes. you don't have to lose sleep every yeah. night about yeah being yeah. sued and and the reason that we always fear the worst is you know it's, it's a type of cognitive bias that we have so there's a couple of things that affect it so first of all there's what's called availability bias so when your brain tends to recall the information that is most readily available so if you look at for example you read a dental legal publication it's full of articles about things that have gone wrong you know now if somebody was to publish an article suggesting that a patient has come into the practice, they've had pain from an upper molar, the dentist has carried out a root canal treatment, provided a cuspal coverage on lay, and the patient is happy and patient and dentist live happily ever after, that story is not going to attract a big readership. Yeah, The reality is the scenario I've just described is what happens most of the time to most of the dentist most days of the working week. But the stuff that's published, the material that's published, is the material that shows things have gone wrong. So consequently, we are seeing just these um, sort of snapshots, and it leads to what's called availability bias. And then the other thing that happens is, when you talk to your friends and colleagues, um, so let's say you were to say to me about, oh, patients are very, very demanding. You know, I can think of an example um, from two or three months ago, where a patient that I treated was very, very demanding. So I will say to you, actually, Sonia, you're absolutely right in what you say. I had this lady who didn't understand what I was trying to do, et cetera, et cetera. But I forget to tell you that there were 999 other patients who actually were, were okay. So I'm not seeing the picture in the true context. I'm just picking out these little episodes. And it affects the way we perceive the world, you know. Completely, it, it completely affects it. So, you know, it's a fascinating area in terms of how we perceive things. And you know, I think um, we have to be, we have to kind of be aware of the true risk level, and also, I think it's about risk intelligence. I think that I think it's a phrase that's not often used in dentistry, but I think we need. If we talk about risk management, we have to also talk about risk intelligence a true perspective on the true level of risk and threat as opposed to our perception. Yeah. I think your point around perception yeah. is related to the mindset shift that every dentist or every person is is in control of themselves. Yes, indeed. Yes. And that's really where we wanted to, to, to focus on, which was how do you maintain a positive outlook on your career as a dentist, which, as you've just outlined, is full of stresses. Yes. And I think in your long career, and I think you've been, I think you've been rather humble in the way that you've described all of your achievements, because I think you've had massive impact on on multiple areas of the dental industry. It's very kind. How? What insights do you have around maintaining a level of positivity? Do you do you have tips? tricks and tools that you have found useful yourself? Yeah, I think um, a, a proportion of the positivity, um, what we're really talking about here is work satisfaction, I think. I think generally speaking, people find time pressures, um, and people are uncomfortable with time pressures. They don't, they don't feel they're enjoying their work. And they perhaps feel that they can't deliver the work to the quality that they're able to because of various pressures from, the, for example, the NHS. I mean, there's other pressures as well. Um, so I think what we have to do is we really have to um, think about, each, each person has to sort of sit down and think, okay, what is it that I need from my job, from my work, to make my work fulfilling? And I think broadly speaking, there's three things. That, that make a difference. I think firstly, um, you need autonomy in, in any job, the, the, the ability to make, make your own decisions. 
Secondly, I think you need um, a connection between effort and reward. Um, I think that's very important. And then thirdly, which is a difficult one, a slightly more philosophical view is, I think it's important that you feel, particularly in healthcare, that you are part of a bigger picture and you are involved in the greater good. And I do sometimes wonder whether the third element is not discussed as much as I would like it to be discussed because there are plenty of studies that show that without that key third element, people feel unfulfilled in their careers. Yeah. And I think the longer that you're in dentistry, the more important the third element becomes. That's been my experience. So give, give me some examples of how that could look practically for a dentist who says, well, I agree with that, but I don't really know how to find that third piece of the puzzle. I think part of it um, is um, I think you you have to have that sort of mindset, to be perfectly honest. I think, I think if people have gone into dentistry for reasons that doesn't include that third element, um, the feeling that they want to do good, to put it um, to, to put in to use that phrase, then I think it's difficult to find. So I think that comes down to selection and um, and and people making the choice of career because I think in healthcare you have to be a caring person and you have to believe in that greater good element. I think it's very, very important. And I think, you know, you mentioned positivity earlier. Um, I mean, there are, you know, th there are lots of ways of looking at positivity. I'm, I always go back to the work that was done by a gentleman called Martin Seligman, who's generally considered to be the father of positive psychology. And he has a model which I think fits well for dentistry. That, you know, he basically, he says um, that what you need to be happy in your work, um, you need three elements. You must lead what he described as a pleasant life. So a life that is comfortable, enjoyable, um, and... Uh, something and, and the focus on the of the pleasant life is being comfortable, both um, feeling safe, financially comfortable, and so forth. He then also talks about what he calls the the good life, which is his focus on personal strengths and weaknesses, um, building on those. And then importantly, the third element, which he calls the meaningful life, and the meaningful life is this greater good perspective so if you in answer to your question what do people need to do i think you need to look at your life and you need to put a tick against the three boxes and say you know is my life pleasant is it a good life and is it a meaningful life and the third one is is hard to deliver because you know we live in a society nowadays where many of us have the means but we don't always have the meaning and you need the meaning as well as the means. Otherwise, there's there's a gap. There's a gap. Completely agree. Yeah, yeah. Very, very powerful and very difficult to put your finger on yes. what it will be that gives you that sense of meaning. And, yes. and I think it also relates to that point that you made yes. earlier, which is if I'm in a, in, a, in a place in my career, I don't feel like it's going backwards or forwards. I feel like I'm a little bit stationary. Yes. How can I possibly find excitement and meaning, even if my life is quite good and I'm quite yes. comfortable? Yes. How do, how do I how do I unlock that? Yes. You know what? Because I'm so time poor. Yes. Where am I supposed to find that? I mean, did you have times in your career where you had that, and, and what did you do? Yes, I think one of the things when I look back, and I'm not one of these people that kind of wishes he'd done things differently. I think all experiences contribute to one's. Um, so ultimate sort of persona and, you know, the person that you become. So I think all experience is good from that point of view. Uh, or, or, or all experience is valuable, let's say. Um, but one thing that I would change, and that is this notion that the way things are are as follows. You work hard, you become successful, and you become, therefore, you become happy. And that was the mantra of education. 
and I, I can see you're smiling at me, and, and I think you know where I'm going with this. Stacks of modern research suggest that's not how it works, actually. The formula actually is work hard, be happy, and then become successful. And um, this, 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 this desire for happiness is not necessarily an outcome. It's actually something that you have to put in, and it's a way that you must be, and um, then you get the best results from your profession, I think. I think that's an incredible way to shift the focus from, I expect life to make me happy and I'll be a passive recipient of the happiness. Absolutely. And if other people have got more happiness than me, then it's unfair. Yes. To making it your responsibility yourself yes. to go and find ways that you can find joy and meaning from yes. even something quite small. Um, for example, I had a, a great day where no one complained. I mean, that should go as a tick. Absolutely not right. Not just an absence of news. Absolutely right. I agree. That. And, and that's a lovely expression. And, and I think also the thing with this is that, um, you know, we currently, you know, we, we have so much work and research being done in neuroscience that these, these ideas and theories now can be validated through the science. And... Um, this 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 concept of you know happiness being something that you can control up to a point i mean the studies suggest that you know maybe 50 percent is genetically determined but there is up to another 50 percent that's available for the individual to decide the, the frame that they want to uh, the, 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 not the frame it's for the individual to decide how they want to be for the other 50 percent um so you can influence your state quite a lot and I think that that's the key. I think we need to rethink. And what also ties in with this is this um, notion of, you know, internal motivation. Because um, most jobs, most careers, people look and they're they're driven by external motivation. You know, there's a reward, whether it's reputation, financial, uh, feel good factor. People are looking for the reward, and that's fine. Nothing wrong with that at all, right? But actually, there's a there's another element to it, which is that you must feel fulfilled with what you do. You must look at your work and 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 look upon it with pride. Enjoy the work that you're doing. You know, um, I think Aristotle famously said, you know, pleasure in the job puts perfection in the work, or words to that effect. So. Being in the right state of mind is extremely important. Enjoy what you do. Never Enjoy work a day you of your life. Yeah, I, I think that's. I think that again, very, yeah. very helpful to to think about going to your work tomorrow and looking around and saying, not many people in the world can do what I do. Um, I change lives every day. That's a privilege, and it is a privilege, uh, not yes. not something many people can say. I mean, obviously, when I notice it when people apply to work with us. Yes, and coming from other tech industries and saying, look, I just want more meaning. I want to be doing something that changes lives. And and for we almost take that for granted actually. Um that every day you can you can see the impact on a on a patient and, and, and the clinician. Obviously we're more interested in well, we're interested in looking after the clinician yeah. and, and making them feel good about what they do. So we take that for granted massively. Yes. And I will say that I think the perception perhaps that, that dentists have of what people think of them, you know, when if, if every couple of, you know, patients that come in are scared of you uh, and of what you're going to do to them and I've had a really bad experience in the past, over time that weighs on you and, 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 and you start to feel, I imagine, that um, people are not grateful for your work and that you're not doing something important. I wonder if there's a way that the conversation needs to shift across dentistry to remind people it's not all about no one can get an NHS appointment and 50% um, of the population is scared of the dentist. Mm. And I don't know what you think about that. I think it is. I think we do need that shift. And I think it's going to be very difficult to for that shift to occur across the profession in a, in a sort of sweeping way. I don't think there is a magic wand. I think the solution to it is a very personal view is, I think it's up to each of us as an individual with the, our patient base 
to do what we can to change the focus and the perception of the patients. You know, I've been in a very fortunate position that in, in both practices, um, you know, I worked in both practices for over 30 years. And the relationship you have with the patients after 10, 15, 20 years changes. And I remember my first, um, the first job I had, my boss said to me, as I was leaving on, on, on the last day I was there, he said, um, he said, Raj, he said, good luck in your own practice. He said, keep in touch with us. We'd like to see how you're getting on. And he said, and always remember, Raj, you will end up with a practice that you deserve. So don't blame anybody else. That was a very powerful statement. And what it made me realize was actually you can influence your own patients and you can make it a not unpleasant experience attending the dentist. You know, and over the years, you, you, know, you have patients who say to you things like, well, thank you for my treatment. I'm happy with the result and everything. Um, you know, it wasn't particularly enjoyable having it done, but I'm pleased with the outcome. And I think the way that we change the perception is we focus on the outcome. Um, rather than on the experience necessarily. And, um, you know, when patients often ingest this, well, I hope I don't have to see you for a while. And then they say, oh, don't take it personally. And that's their way of saying, actually, I do like coming here, even though it's not great fun having the work done, which is understandable. You know, I have a couple of my friends who are dentists who are patients, and, you know, I'm a patient, and I feel exactly the same way. <laughs> I think you, you've mentioned a few people that have been influential in your life. And I wanted to touch on the concept of mentorship in dentistry because yeah. there's no denying it. Although you're seeing patients all day, every day, it can be quite lonely as a profession working in primary care. And I mean, any kind of clinician working mm -hmm. in primary care. Um, how do you think a, a dentist who perhaps doesn't have obvious mentors, how, how, how can they think about mentorship and, and the benefits that it can bring? Again, it's an area that I think is very, very important and people don't always, I think, give it, in my opinion at least, give it the attention that it deserves. I think we all need mentors. I think it's very, very important. And I think we also, we all need sort of true friends in the profession. And your mentors can be your true friends as well. I think you have to be careful who you choose as your mentor. You know, if I can quote a very good friend of mine from a completely different, um, from a completely different sort of profession, if you like, um, he's a, he's a professional magician and he's, um, he's, he's, he's a very, very able magician and uh, he's, he's a good friend and it's an area that I'm interested in. It's, it's, a, it's a hobby of mine, has been for many years. And I remember talking to him years and years ago, and he said to me, he said, um, he said, you're you're ready for a mentor. And he paused, and then he said, and Raj, he said, please remember, yeah, your mentor must be several steps ahead of you, not just one or two steps. And I think that's what's really important. I think when you choose your mentors, mentors must be individuals who've had a breadth of experience, who've had... Um, uh, 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 who have a breadth of knowledge and who can support you and guide you and you know perhaps even provide some coaching from time to time it's different from mentoring but the principles are the same um i think that's the most important thing to do and, and what do you do if you've identified such a person do you just go and ask them or do you develop that connection over time I think you can go and ask them i mean in my experience when you go to a fellow professional and say look um I respect you for X, Y, and Z. I would like to seek your help or your guidance or your advice. Um, people are very, very willing to give up their time because it's a privilege to help people. You know, it's a privilege to help people. And, you know, I was involved with foundation training, as I've said, for many, many years. And all my colleagues, without exception, um, when, they, when they had the vocational trainees, as we used to call them in the old days, with them for a year, the relationship never ended after a year. Those people stayed connected with their tutors and their course organizers for many, many years to come. And, you know, I've not been involved with foundation training now since 2016, but, you know, only the other day I saw one of, one of my friends who was on my scheme in the mid-1990s. Um, so, 
you know, not only do you make new friends, but those people become your mentors over a period of time. So I think that I think that's a helpful way to think about yeah. finding people if it's not obvious to you already. Because sometimes it'll be really obvious who yes. it is, yes, and you, you may will. not have yes. had a yes. formal discussion about well, yeah. are we or are we not mm. mentor and mentee. Yes. But I imagine, especially if you're working perhaps in a in a smaller practice, um, not many people doing similar things around, that it can be difficult. I guess my sort of you talked about friendship. Um, and yes, I think that's an yes, important, yes. A, an important point. What are your thoughts on friendship in in dentistry or in or in life in general? Um, well, I think I'm 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 going to sort of go back to Aristotle here, um, and um, I've always felt that Aristotle's philosophical view on the nature of friendship. When I first came across it, I thought this this is a very elegant summary. And um, so basically what Aristotle said was he said, friends fall into one of three categories. He described these three categories as um, utility friends, friends that you have because they will be useful to you. So, for example, typically, you know, you get a phone call from somebody you haven't spoken to for two or three years and they ring up and they say, oh, how are you? I just thought I'd give you a ring, et cetera, et cetera. And at the end of the conversation, they will say, oh, just before I go, I have something to ask you. That's a utility friendship. And that's a fine. That's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And there, there is a place for that. Uh, he then described as a second category um, friends that he described, friends for, for, friends for pleasure, with whom you share activities and enjoyment and, and so forth. So that was built largely around um, pleasure, enjoyment, uh, sort of um, uplifting sort of environment, sharing them. And then the third category, which he describes as in a friends of the good, people who share your values, people who share your beliefs and who have a similar outlook on life as you do. And I think the key to it is that we will all have lots of utility friends. We'll have lots of friends for pleasure. But in life, you usually just end up with a few friends of the good. And again, in an era, in a world where everyone is everybody's friend through social media, I think we forget you cannot create a friend of the good through a social media platform because the platform does not allow you to easily get your values across and so forth. These these things are things that we can um, evaluate by spending time with people uh, and, and, and the brevity of social media doesn't allow for that. Yeah, these, the, the, you have to nurture these relationships. And I think that's what's missing. I think that's what's missing. I think we need to go back and rediscover friends of the good. Raj, what an amazing note on which to conclude our, our discussion. I think one thing I might ask is if you could give one bit of advice for a dentist looking for more positivity, what would you say? I would say um, rediscover the joy of dentistry and enjoy the company and the trust that your patients place in you. Super powerful. Yep. Super powerful. Really love that. Raj, it's been such a fantastic conversation. I think your philosophical outlook on life and your knowledge of philosophers as well, <laughs> I think you've quoted at least three directly, um, is really inspiring, Raj. You've had an amazing career and, it, and it's it's great that you're here sharing your experience with, with especially younger dentists who are just starting out and have all of this to learn, which is which is what we're here for at The Modern Dentist. You asked me, Sonia, about what my advice would be. And, you know, I, I, I gave you my view from a position of great humility. But if I can just share with you, if I can just quote one more philosopher to you, which is Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche, who uh, famously hundreds of years ago uh, wrote the following statement. He said, um, I was in darkness, but I took three steps and found myself in paradise. The first step was a good thought. 
The second step was a good word. And the third step was a good deed. And I think that trumps what I said. I think if it's stood the test of many, many years, I think he had longer to prepare for it perhaps than you did. (laughs) (laughs) So um, thank you for for sharing that. And I would say that those three steps could probably be achieved in a day if you really, if you really gave it a push. (laughs) Absolutely right. Raj, it's been fantastic to have you. Thank you for, for sharing all of that with us. And that concludes another episode of The Modern Dentist. You guys know where to find us. Follow us where you normally listen to your podcasts and follow our Instagram, moderndentist underscore UK. See you next time.